You left the Air Force in better humour than when you, uh, your post, I should say, uh, uh, in the Air Force in better humour than when you arrived? No, not really. There was little you could do? Yes. There, there, there were an awful lot of things that you, you could do, which I, I think I did. Um, I mean, an example. I mean, I mean, I mean, just just one little example of the things. I mean, I, I've obviously felt very, very strongly about the manpower problems in the Air Force because everything that we did, I, we did a, a sort of a future strategy day for for the Air Force in in my last year. And when you look, did you do a SWOT analysis, which you are no doubt are familiar with? You know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and so on. Everything came back to the simple fact that the greatest strength in the Royal Air Force was its people, the quality of the men and women in the service. And if we did nothing else, we had to protect that quality within the Air Force. And that meant not just retaining people, so we, we didn't lose the, the, the vast amount of experience, the technical experience, the operational experience, because people were going uh, too soon, but that we actually attracted similar quality people I into the Air Force. And that was hugely important. And then when you looked around what the Air Force was doing, and particularly a bee in my bonnet, was that when I went round the service, in a number of places in the officer structure, and particularly in, in the ground branches, you found warrant officers were doing the jobs that were, should have been filled by junior officers. Why? Because we couldn't recruit them. So why weren't the warrant officers being commissioned and so on, well, as opposed to going out at various stages? And I'd seen this happen in the army. In the army, you know, it, it went, if you were suitable for commissioning, warrant officers got commissioned very quickly. And so I said, we're going to do this in the Air Force. Uh, I see absolutely no reason why we shouldn't fast track. Well, I remember people saying, but you know, we're, we're going to get a second class officer in the Royal Air Force. I said, good, because I know too many third class officers, etc., which <laughs> kill one, one argument, slight exaggeration. But the, the thing was, they were saying, well, they, they aren't volunteering. And I said, but, well, for Christ's cri sake, you know, if you were a warrant officer, let's say age 35, who had been, you know, done really well to get to get his royal warrant at, at that age, are you going to go to Cranwell and then submit yourself to initial officer training when you've got sergeants yelling at you who only you know, a couple of days before were calling you sir and so on? I said, it's just not human nature. Why should they have to do this? And particularly if they're already doing an officer's job. So we're going to have fast tracking of warrant officers in the Air Force. Uh, that's precisely what happened. And uh, I do remember very clearly going up to Cranwell. Uh, I said, one thing I did throw my toys out of the cot about, I said, it's got to be done in a weekend. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. I said, they, they, they go to Cranwell on a Friday, give them their uniforms, turn them out Queen's regulations or whatever and kick him out on Monday and they, they're flight lieutenant straight away. Well, and then someone came back and said, we need an extra day. And I said, what's that for? And they said, sword drill. And I, went, I went, and then it went bonkers. Um, anyway, so that was kicked out. And basically, I forget, it was a little bit long, that it was about four or five days. And uh, I went up for the first commissioning of these chats, which we you know, gave them a, a nice scroll. And, and so, in fact, I knew a couple of them from the past. But the interesting thing was, I mean, they were very, in fact, a couple of them ended up as wing commanders. Um, the interesting thing was, it was their wives. And their wives, almost without exception, were professional women. They were teachers, uh, nurses, and things like that. And their pleasure at seeing their husbands have an extension of service, well, not an extension of service, because they'd have stayed in the Air Force as a warrant officer at age 55 if they wanted to but then completely new avenue of advancement opening up in front of them within the Royal Air Force. That, to me, was the greatest reward. So you could do things, but getting back to your question about leaving the Air Force, did I feel happier? I felt very happy and I felt very proud to have done the job and to have had this great privilege of being the professional head of the service. But the Air Force that I left uh, in 2000, uh, it wasn't as operationally good, I thought, as the one that uh, I inherited, um, simply because the rate of technology was advancing so quickly that we couldn't keep up with it because we, we, we knew what to do, but we didn't have the money to do it. And as I left, 
uh, well, several months before I left, all the signs were there for another big raid on the defence budget. Did it occur? Yes. Um, I, I can remember very clearly that at an Air Force Board Standing Committee meeting early in uh, the year 2000, VCDS, Vice Chief of the Defence Staff, uh, Admiral Sir Peter Abbott, who was a great chum of mine, we had, we had suffered during the Not Defence Review together, and we had been at RCDS together, and uh, Admiral um, Lackham came down to see us to brief us on further savings that were required from the defence budget. And it wasn't just further savings, we were under pressure at the time, we had to produce 2% uh, efficient, so-called efficiency savings, and that was going to go up to 3%. Uh, well, it didn't sound very much, but in terms of the money that you got, it was a lot of money. And I thought, here we go again. Yeah, very sad. Yeah. Your book is, uh, is fascinating, and it's very rare that we get a chance to pick the mind of someone who's been in the most senior ranks of the Air Force, and yet has a background that goes way back to aviation in the first generation uh, of jet fighters. So thank you very much indeed for writing the book. Uh, it, it's lovely. I very much enjoyed reading it. And thank you very much indeed for talking to us about it today. Well, thank you very much indeed. Much enjoyed our chat. There's no doubt that Sir Richard Johns had a most illustrious career, which took him from an officer cadet at RAF Cranwell to the highest ranking officer in the Royal Air Force. Along the way, he flew the very first generation of jet fighters, progressing to one of my favourites, the Hawker Hunter, and onto the most remarkable aircraft ever to fly, the Harrier. He describes many of his more daring exploits in amusing detail, some of which will make your eyebrows rise. In addition, the recollections of his time as a flying instructor with one very special student are great. His career took off in more ways than one and he forged through to some great posts as a squadron commander, station commander and then up into the highest echelons of command. Whilst many of us will prefer to read about his flying exploits, it's also interesting to hear about the life of those who achieve air rank and end up in the exotic and difficult job of dealing with a government intent on paring down the size of the service that he so obviously loves. This book may well have a place on the shelves of both aviation enthusiasts and senior politicians alike.